Hey everyone, so this is a PlayStation controller, and this is a video of a PlayStation controller. Except this isn't a real PlayStation controller, it was shot on an iPhone and rendered in AR. And what I'm gonna show you next is going to blow you away. Plus, I'm gonna show you a new video to video model that I think is going to usher in the next generation of AI video. I've got a pretty remarkable AI language translator that you can play with, a hack for Midjourney's new in-painting feature, plus a quick shootout of Midjourney versus Photoshop's generative fill, plus a look at a Ghostbusters short film that was shot by Jason Reitman on a virtual set and rendered all in real time. Okay, let's dive in. So that PlayStation controller comes to us via Simulon, a new AI VFX app that is currently in beta, but check this out. So yeah, this is pretty wild, right? Uh, obviously the mech is the thing that's gonna call your attention and your eyes, uh, but I do wanna point out that the glass ball, the metal ball, the table and the rug aren't real either. Hey, it's this lady again. Here's another example, and I think that a lot of you might end up jumping to thinking, oh, this is like Wonder Studio, the VFX app that rotoscoped and mocapped. But according to Devesh Naidu, the founder of Simulon, the mocap solution will be very different from Wonder Studios, but we'll have to wait to see what that looks like. In the meantime, Devesh did post up a quick fight sequence featuring a model of K2S2, the droid from Rogue One. This looks pretty great. The contextual lighting on the models is super, super on point. One thing to note that I think kind of gets missed is the motion blur on the models. You can see it when you scrub through it very slowly. It looks so, so good. I mean, that's super realistic. So while this is touted as real time, I don't think that that fight sequence that you saw was generated completely in real time, but rather via a live preview. Um, there was this older demo that I ran across of Simulon where clearly, you know, we have these models, you load it in and then it appears in AR space. The model is flat and clearly not lit. So I believe you end up shooting your scene and then firing it off to the Simulon cloud servers to have it fully render or What's super cool is that you can apparently render it on your local machine for free. All this is possible due to a new technology called Gaussian splatting, which is also the name of my new punk rock band, by the way. The code and abstract for Gaussian splatting is linked below. I did read over the abstract and, and kind of my you know caveman understanding of it. The breakthrough here is Gaussian splatting takes landmark pinpoints in a reference image instead of trying to capture every detail. And then it can kind of overlap these landmark areas to create a cohesive environment. And the fact that it isn't trying to capture every detail frees up a lot of computing resources, unlike other previous methods. Simulon is in beta right now. It is only for iOS currently. You can sign up at the link below. Next up, we have a new video to video model that looks pretty remarkable. It's called CODEF and stands for Content Deformation Fields for Temporarily Consistent Video Processing. CODEF. CODEF is definitely the name of Gaussian Splatter's first album. The biggest thing that CODEF seems to have solved is that warping hallucinogenic look that's inherently baked into AI video to video models. The reason that diffusion models have this, I hesitate to call it a problem because I actually kind of like the overall look, but the way that they work is that that each frame of video is generated off the previous frame. So it kind of has a whisper down the lane aspect to it. Codef has solved this problem via a pretty unique method. Once again, going through and reading the abstract. So my all thumbs reading of the abstract is basically that it takes every frame of video and compresses it down into like a book. And then you can apply a style on the top of the book that then affects every page beneath it. There's also some other really cool stuff like point-based tracking that's included in this. Uh, we saw that in the egg yolk with the heart on it. So yes, you can do tracking within CODEF as well. Also an upscaler and super resolution in here as well. I don't know how well you guys can see this considering that, you know, it's compressed video that is then compressed and then put on YouTube. So uh, you can check out all of this at the link below and see it on your own monitor. There isn't an easy way to use CODEF yet, but the code is available on GitHub. So if you have the know-how and a beefy enough machine, you can run it. Speaking of AI video, apparently Banerjee, the production company behind Big Brother, Survivor, and MasterChef are doubling down on AI. In a statement, Banerjee said, the age of AI is upon us, and as it begins to shape our world, there are increasing demands for people to create fresh, forward-thinking formats in the technology space. This is a pretty big deal as Banerjee is the largest independent production studio in the world. Uh, they released 200 non-scripted shows just last year and more than 90 pilots. 
This is obviously pretty interesting considering that there is the WGA and SAG strike, which have pretty much grinded Hollywood to a complete stop with AI being a major issue at its center. But here we have a French production studio that is not beholden to any union rules because it has primarily focused on reality programming. And I'm not gonna get too deep into the woods here, but in the 2008 WGA strike, uh, reality producers and writers were iced out of the union by the WGA. If you're interested in learning more about the 2008 strike, I highly recommend a fantastic podcast by Tansy Gardner called Striking Out. Also, if you're a Star Wars nerd like I am, the podcast goes deep into the making of Rogue One and Solo. It's highly recommended. It is a fantastic podcast. Moving on, the Universal Translator is nearly here, or uh, Babblefish, depending on how much you like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Meta have released a new language translation model that you can use in your browser. Let's take a look at it. As always, I hope that someone in the audience can verify the accuracy of these translations. Um, so I just recorded this with my laptop mic. Hello, my name is Tim, and I am speaking in a different language. How's it sound? Translating it into Italian, let's see how it sounds. Salve, mi chiamo Tim e parlo in una lingua diversa. I, I don't know if that's accurate or not. There are obviously a number of other languages that we can try out as well. Uh, let's give it a shot in German and see how it sounds. Hallo, mein Name ist Tim und ich spreche eine andere Sprache. Wie klingt es? And now in Spanish. Hola, mi nombre es Tim y estoy hablando en un lenguaje diferente. ¿Cómo suena? Overall, I'm really happy with the way that this technology is evolving. Last week, I was on vacation or holiday, if you're European, in Costa Rica, which is beautiful, by the way, and the people are wonderful, but my Spanish sucks. That said, I was able to get by and communicate with locals just by using Google Translate on my phone. As the tech moves forward, one of the things that I think is an inevitability is when it merges with something like Eleven Labs and we're doing real-time translations in our own voices. This week, in painting arrived in mid-journey. I did a full deep dive into it in the last video, but even just within that day, a few tricks have already emerged. For one, apparently the in-painting model does use a different version. Some are thinking that it's either version 5.3 or or early version six. So a fun trick to kind of preview the new version is to take an image. This is one that we used in the deep dive. This is a portrait photograph, Joan of Arc, styled by Annie Leibovitz, large format camera, 35 millimeter lens, studio lighting, neutral background and an aspect ratio of three to run a very region in paint on it but just cover the entire image and run the same prompt. And when you do, you're essentially re-rolling that image with the new model. There's a pretty significant difference in photographic models, but for artistic styles, it actually does some pretty cool stuff as well. Here's another image that I wasn't too keen on, but highlighting the entire thing and in painting it with the same prompt led to these images, which to me do feel significantly more detailed. That said, there is a reason that this model has not been released yet, and this is definitely not intended use case. Uh, take, for example, this image, which was cinematic still, wide angle, filmed by Quentin Tarantino, a man sitting in a Los Angeles diner, drinking coffee, black suit, 1960s aesthetic, and then running the very in-paint over the entire image leads to this, which is kind of a mess. Um, you know, in image one, our guy has no arm. Uh, in image two, that coffee cup is super, super tiny. And in image four, uh, I don't know what's going on with that table. It's basically down by his knees. Though I got to admit, looking at the aesthetics of image one really kind of makes me a little nostalgic for the days of Mid Journey version four. Been on record as saying, I think that version had a little something extra in it. It was just gritty and weird. Speaking of in-painting, Tatiana Segluvia posted up a comparison of Midjourney's in-painting versus Photoshop's Gen Fill. Stepping through it and looking a little closer, there's some pretty interesting things in here. Uh, the t-shirts on both sides look pretty good. There's a weird sort of white artifact on the Photoshop Gen Fill version. Definitely two different styles of aesthetics with the cars. And I did find the potted tree example to be pretty interesting, considering that Mid Journey actually lost the ocean in the window in its version, whereas Photoshop got it. Although Photoshop did put a weird water line on this wall as well. The lipstick example really showcases, I think one of Adobe's major weaknesses. Um, it never does really well with smiles, teeth, and in this case, lipstick, where that's not her color. To me, that's just not her color. 
overall, I think they both have their strengths and weaknesses. You know, it's a matter of the right tool for the right job. But please let me know in the comments what you guys think. Back over to Hollywood, Sony Pictures recently flexed with a Ghostbusters short film directed by Jason Reitman, director of Ghostbusters Afterlife, that was shot on a virtual set and everything was rendered in real time. The team obviously took a very traditional approach to the production, starting with a script, going through storyboards, uh, virtual scouting, animatics, and then the actual shoot itself. Everything was captured in mocap and then rendered in real time using the Unreal Engine. I think the actual city might have been the same Epic Games city used for the Matrix Awakens game. You can watch the full presentation as well as the short film at the link below. I will say overall, uh, it does kind of have a very modern video game cutscene kind of look and feel to it. But what struck me the most was the fact that all of this could be accomplished by any one of us working in a small team with very readily available tools really all comes down to story and execution. Reitman is obviously a very gifted storyteller, but I hope that this inspires you to go out and make something awesome. I thank you for watching. My name is Tim.